What is church? God is good. And all the time, God is good. Let's do that again. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let me just get. I hope that all of you are feeling less this morning as I am. And indeed that God is good always. And uh, thank you for Brother Alex for reading our scripture, reading for this morning. So this morning we will be talking about this question. Why does God allow suffering and pain? You know, my dear brethren, this question has been around for years. And uh, it's probably um, older than anybody who is the uh, oldest around in this, uh, or in this room. Okay. Let me just put this so everybody can... Uh, can listen. <laughs> okay. So, the question, again, it's been around for many, many years, and people are actually looking for, for answers to this question. And uh, I will answer this tough question with just three words, and I am done. He is God. Why does God allow suffering and pain? Because He is God. And so that's my answer. And so we are finished. <laughs> that's our lesson for this morning. But if we will look at the question, if we look at the question really carefully, now, the question suggests that there is God, right? Why does God allow suffering and pain? So it suggests that there is God. Now, it's quite ironic to think that most of those who ask this question or the existence of God are those that don't really believe in God, you know, in the real sense of the word. Okay? Though they believe in God, but they don't really serve God. Okay? So in the real sense of the word, they are not actually believers of God. Okay? So now we, before going any in answering these questions and uh, let me put everything first in its right perspective now again this question suggests that there is God now let us start off and let me start off by you know leveling the uh, playing field and it came to my thought that this guy is doing a handstand <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> so let us uh, level the playing field and in doing so let me define to you what is survival of the fittest because this has something to do with our lesson this morning according to Oxford dictionary survival of the fittest is defined as the continued existence of organisms which are best adapted to the environment with the extinction of others as a concept of the darwinian theory of Evolution. Now, for the sake of our discussion this morning, um, let us assume that we are not created by God, just for this time being. Okay? Let us put God away from our thought for the meantime, and uh, we will follow the theory of the other people, that we are created, or uh, the, the evolution um, had its way, and the Big Bang Theory, and all those uh, stuff. Now, God, we are not created by God. Okay. So, they say that, again, as I mentioned earlier, we came from small specks of a micro, super micro, tiny organism. And then we evolve. Okay. As time passes by, we evolve. And then, um, we evolve in the survival of the fittest, okay, the only law that will exist is only survival of the fittest. Now, um, fittest 
for the fittest, according to Charles Darwin, is the one most adaptable to change. Now, it simply means that you must learn to adapt to change. You must learn to use the surround, you must learn to use the resources available to you. You adapt to the surroundings and you adapt to the situations you are in so that uh, you can use those things in your advantage to survive and to somehow reproduce. Okay. Now, I will give you an example, um, and I like this example, the lion and the hyenas. Okay. The lion, because he's the king of the jungle, um, he saw two hyenas. Now, because he's the king of the jungle, and uh, he's the strongest, so he thought that uh, he can feed and he can devour the two hyenas. So the two hyenas, using probably their uh, decision, they being smart, they run away. They run away as far as they can, and then, to the surprise of the lion, the two hyenas brought the lion to their turf. And all of a sudden, 15 hyenas suddenly appeared from out of nowhere, from the bushes. And then the lion was devoured. So in the concept of, somehow, in the concept of the uh, survival of the fittest, adapting to change, the strongest doesn't really mean that you will survive. Somehow, it will be the smartest. And somehow, it will be the weakest because you know how to adapt to the situation. Now, that is survival of the fetus. Now, a classic example that I want to give to you is, for example, like Brother Kennedy here, in, the, in that kind of world, I saw him with his family, they're having wonderful dinner, and my family, we are starving, we, are not, uh, we, have, not, we have not eaten for two days. So we saw his family, and we outnumbered his family three to one. So we went up to his family, we, we gang up on his family, we beat him to death, we get their food, and we eat, okay? We survived, they died in the process. Now, somebody would tell me, oh, that is evil, it's bad. But to come to think of it, is it really bad? Is it really evil? In the world where the only law is to survive, it's not only bad. Why? Because nothing is to define what is good and what is bad. Because the only law that matters is the law of the survival of the fetus. You get the point. There's no moral, moral law to define what is good between bad. Okay? So, they naturally, they just die. Now, people will tell me, oh, you rob them of their food. What do you mean rob? What is robbery? Oh, you murder them. What is murder? There's nothing to define murder. We just took their food. We eat. They die. That's the natural process. Okay? And people, under that assumption of world that God did not create the world, people will eventually die. And that it's not a bad thing in that kind of world because that's the natural law. Everybody will soon die. Okay, so the life cycle would be we evolve, um, I reproduce, then I die. That is in the law of the survival of the fetus. Now here's a thought. Is it bad to die? in that world, in that kind of world. Okay. It's not bad to die. It is just part of the cycle. Correct? Now, here's another thought. Under the assumption that God did not create the universe, do you think that people will not suffer? Do you think that people will not die if God did not create the world? No. People will still die. People will still starve. People will still suffer. Just like what we did to the family of Brother Kennedy. They starved, took their food, they died. You see, in a world where God did not aid, 
still there will be suffering, correct? There will be pain, and there will be death, right? So, what's now the difference between with God and without God? Being created by God and not created by God. The only, or not the only, but one of the difference is that without God, there's nothing to blame. Who are you to blame? Who are you to blame for your misery? There's no law. Who are you to blame when someone died? No one. No one. You go ahead and blame the scientists. But without or with God, ah, that's a totally different story. We are to blame God for our misery. We blame God for our sufferings. We blame God for death. But then again, if you look at very carefully, are we, are, are we fair in our judgment with God? Okay? Now, to be honest with yourself, do you expect with God people will not die? Do you expect that with God you are going to die? Do you expect that with God you will not have sickness? Oh, go ahead. You read John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world, we will have more troubles and tribulations. Jesus Christ said that. And lo, I have overcome the world. Do you expect that with God, you will never feel any pain? No. So again, what's the difference? The difference, my dear brethren and friends, is that with God, we have someone to blame. But without God, we have no one to blame. No one to blame to. Okay. Now, the next question is, now if God is all loving, then why didn't he step in? Okay. Now again, we are quick to blame. Oh, it's God's uh, problem. It's God's fault, rather. Okay. He is so loving, he did not step in to avoid this kind of misery. But again, if there was no God in the future, all of those things will still happen. Correct? Now, another difference between without God and with God is with God, there is order. Okay? There is order. Right? Because there is now what we call moral law. Okay? Godly moral law. Okay? There is now order. Now, you can now define what's good and what is bad. Because good it emanates from God. It comes from God. When God created the universe, He said the word good. See, good can only come from God. And according to Micah chapter 6, verse 8, uh, verse eight God told us that I have told you, O man, what is good. Okay? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. You see, only with God can there be real order. Because in the world where there is no God, there is no real order. There is chaos. Because there is no law. You fail to survive. That's the only law. Okay. Again, with God, there can be real order and there can be real peace. Because there is now what we call moral law coming from God. Now again, God is good in all the time. Those words must resonate not only from within the four corners of this wall, but must also resonate to go outside. Because those words really have something to do with what we're going to discuss and what we are discussing this morning. Now think carefully. Are we now fair in our judgment with God? Okay. Or even accuse God because God isn't fair. Because God is a loving God and He did not do anything to stop what's happening around the world. Now you see, my dear brethren and friends, by leveling the playing field, I hope it kind of shifted our minds in the way we approach God when things go wrong. I hope it kind of shifted our minds, at least we will now be more subtle and we will now be more 
uh, uh, consider it with all humility in our hearts as we confront God with our emotions when something bad happens to us. Now, the first reason I want to talk to you about um, why God allows suffering is because, really, because He is God. He allowed it because He is God. God allows suffering to establish His sovereignty. Sovereignty. I am that I am. And when we talk of sovereignty, it means that God allowed suffering with His sovereignty because He wants to impress into our mind that He is God and He and we are not. He is higher than us and we are not. That He is our Creator and we are just the creation. Now, sovereignty means that He is absolute in all authority. Remember, I mentioned a while ago the word I am. It's about authority. That God is absolute in all authority that He can do anything He wants of His creation in a manner that pleases Him, of course, for the better of creation. And His authority is unrestricted by His creations. Unrestricted. Now, Job, he clearly understands the sovereignty of God when he said in Job chapter 42, verse 2, I know that you can do everything. Wow. I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld or can be thwarted from you. See, God allows suffering, my dear brethren and friends, to set a boundary between Him and us. He is setting a boundary letting us know that He is the Almighty. That He can do anything and everything to all of us, being His creation. Okay. And therefore, God owes us nothing. He owes us no explanation whatsoever in the reality when things happen or whatever things happen to us. When things happen the way we don't want it to be, God doesn't owe us any explanation because He is God. And that is His sovereignty. Now, when Job suffered so much, one thing that I've learned about reading the book of Job, and I was... We were kind of talking about this yesterday with Brother Derek. You know, I told Brother Derek one, one takeaway that I learned the, from reading Job is when Job suffered so much, he did not need to understand the why of God, why he suffered so much. He did not need to understand that. He only needed to trust God. And sometimes we don't need to understand why things are happening to us. We only need to trust in the Lord. Now, my question is, do you trust God with all your life, with all your heart, with all your soul? That's why God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. Because whatever happens to your life, you cannot do anything about it. You, we can whine and complain all the time, every time. But at the end of the day, can we do something about it? People will die. Yes, people will suffer. Yes. God is sovereign. God just wants us to trust in Him. In Job chapter 13, 15, though He slay me yet, Job said, I will trust in Him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Though whatever happens to me, even though I don't understand it, I will just trust in God. Let God control my life. Let God do as, as He pleases in my life because I am just His creation. Amen. You just need to trust God. And that is His sovereignty. Now again, by defining sovereignty, that God is unrestricted. Meaning, if I can, if I can restrict God, if I can command God, not to do what he wants to do, then he's not God. Because I can restrict him. But God is sovereign. And the meaning of sovereignty is he is unrestricted by his creation. If we can dictate to God, God, do this and do that. Don't do this and don't do that. And we'll say, okay, yes, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. 
then he's not God. He's not God. And he's not sovereign. So the first reason is why God allows suffering and pain is because that is his sovereignty. That is his prerogative. My thoughts are not higher, or my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Throughout the pages of the Bible, we can see that truly indeed, that we must not trust in our own understanding because our thoughts are not the thoughts of God. Our ways are not the ways of God. Our ways are bent on evil, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. In Proverbs chapter 3, we must not trust God or we must, or we must trust in the Lord no matter what. And lean not, which means we must not depend on our own understanding because our own understanding, our own rationality is very much subjective to our own feelings. In our own opinion, we are very much subjective to what we deem is good and what is right. And again, there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it leads to death. So when we lean on our own understanding, we are being subjective most of the time to what we deem is right, to what we deem is good, and to what we deem is comfortable to all of us. That's why the Lord said, do not lean on your own understanding. Now, when God said, do not lean on your own understanding, it suggests that we should lean on to something else, right? Lord, if I will not lean on my understanding, then where should I lean at? And the Lord is clear that we should lean in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ for which we are told to grow up in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Now, if and if we want, don't go our way, we blame God. We hate God. I hate you. And that's why we just cannot depend on our own understanding. That's why the Lord said, lean not on your own understanding, but come and grow into my grace and into my knowledge. Now, we just need to trust God. Now, one, one friend of mine once asked me, why did God just control the world? So that there will be no suffering, there will be no pain. Why didn't God make the world just, just so right? So there will be no evil, there will be no fighting, there will be no wars. Now, at first glance, it seems plausible. It seems okay. Right? But if you will come to think of it really deeply, it's not really good. Now, I tell you why. Number one, there won't be any what we call freedom. Okay? There will be no freedom. And if there's no freedom, we are just forced. You are just forced to do what you are told to do. See? There's no freedom at all. Now imagine yourself controlling the lives of your children. If you are controlling the lives of your children, you are also controlling their emotions. Now imagine your children cannot express the emotions because they are being controlled, because they are being suppressed. Because there's no freedom. Can you imagine that? Will they be happy? No. And I think emotions will not even matter at all. Their hearts won't even matter at all because we are controlling them. Imagine that God is controlling you. Your emotions won't matter. Your heart won't matter. What you won't matter. Because whatever you do, you are controlled by God. And I ask you, do you even like that? Now, second, okay, or let me throw a, a question, rhetorical, I would say rhetorical um, question to all of you. Now, do you think if you are controlled by God, and if you cannot express your emotions, your feelings, whatever you want to say to God. Is that good? No. Okay. 
Now, this is part of God's sovereignty. He gave us free will. And part of God's sovereignty is that He will do whatever it takes because He did good for His creation. Because if we parents know what's best for our children, God's, God knows what's the best test. <laughs> Super the, the best ever. He knows what's the very best for you and I. That's why He gave us a freedom. And you see, because he is a loving God, take a look at this. True love cannot emanate by force. How can you love someone if you are forced to love that person? True love can never emanate by force. Because God wants us to experience real love. God wants us to experience our love, our emotions to our fellow. And God wants us to throw our love, give our love to him with all our hearts, with all our being. And this can only be done, my dear brethren and friends, by what we call choice, free will. See? In Luke chapter 10, 27, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You know, to love God with all these things, can you imagine if you are forced by God? You cannot do all of these things if you are forced by God. You can only do these things with choice, with your freedom, with your free will. See, without freedom, again, our hearts won't even matter. Without freedom of choice, genuine love cannot be achieved because all we have is a forced will. See? Now, Brother Joe, a while ago, said that we will just like be like robot and he was doing like this <laughs> you see if you are controlled by god will just like be a robot your emotions your hearts your mind will matter and you cannot do what luke told us to do see now speaking of love the second word the second reason i want to share with you why there is love or the why there is pain and suffering is because of the word love. The word love. God loves you. Do you know that? Do you know that? Do you believe that? God loves you so much. Now, God's love, from time immemorial, we have seen the love of God. When He created Adam and Eve, He gave them free will in the process. So that's God's love, the part of the love of God. But unfortunately, Adam and Eve, they abuse their free will. They chose to disobey God. And when that happens, sin entered in the world. And God needed a remedy. He needed a remedy so that you and I will not suffer the consequence of their sins. In Romans chapter 5, verse 12, you see, we should have died. You and I should die in our sins. God made a remedy. And what is the remedy? The remedy is love. John 13. You see, we have a problem, the problem of sin. And then God saw the problem and God made a remedy. And the remedy is love. And he chose his only son <clears throat> to cleanse us, forgive us from our sins. And you will ask, what's this have to do with pain and suffering? Actually, there's a lot to do. This has a lot to do with pain and suffering. I will show you a picture. Those are iron cast nails. Those are seven to nine inches long probably this is probably five and a half so probably six seven, seven inches nine inches okay imagine that driven to the hands and feet of our lord jesus christ because of love you see number two the flagellum the whip you see 
so total, uh, so brutal punishment. See, um, you see that it had several thongs and several uh, um, spike and uh, metal or bones <clears throat> attached to it. <clears throat> now, because when you will be whipped with this flagellum, okay, it will rip part of your skin. And uh, some flesh also will come up. Now, an expert once uh, commented that when one stitches all the wounds of our Lord Jesus Christ, he will look like Frankenstein. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine? He will look like a Frankenstein. And he received, according to, the, to tradition, 39 lashes. But he was uh, whipped by the Roman soldier, so they are not uh, under the Jewish tradition of 39 lashes. So they could have uh, whipped our Lord more than 39 times. Okay. Now there is the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns, it can puncture a, uh, a can, a soda can. And when they put that on to our Lord's head, it cuts through the skin. So there's blood coming all over. See? Now, can you imagine those things? Okay. Now, the Roman soldiers, they can uh, give you a one punch, one blow, and uh, you would probably be dead. You know, one expert tells us that a, uh, a single blow, a fist from a Roman soldier can kill a person. Imagine that. They, they punched Jesus Christ for how many times? You see, as I always said, they beat uh, Jesus Christ, you know, they beaten him black and blue. And he was so beaten, he was so um, beaten by the uh, Roman soldiers. I said 52, 14, he was disfigured. Can you imagine? The Lord, he was so disfigured. And his appearance, okay, from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Wow. Can you imagine? Look at your, look at the person beside you. Look at the person beside you. Come on. How handsome and how beautiful they are. All right. Now, I want you to figure out in your mind how Jesus Christ looked like. He was so disfigured. And the Bible said, his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. See? And that's right here, right there. Okay? Now, here's a question. I put this up. Here's the question. Why did God allow, was God allow suffering and pain? Here's my answer. Look at the picture. And tell me. Why? And tell me why. If God didn't allow suffering and pain, this would have never happened. See? If God does not allow suffering and pain, Jesus Christ would never come down from heaven. If God does not allow pain and suffering, we will all must die and should die and must die with our sins. But God allowed it to happen. Because of why? Because of what? And why? Because of love. Did someone tell you in a remorseful way that they are angry at God for allowing his son to die on the cross? Nobody came up to me and said that in a way remorse in a remorseful way, in a way that they are angry. You know, you know we are angry at God. We question God when we are suffering our own suffering. See? When bad things happen to us, we question God. But when this happened to him, nobody, nobody questioned God, hey God, what kind of a father you are? Allowed your son to die such a brutal and cruel death? Like a heinous, you know, have done a heinous crime? No one, nobody, nobody questioned this person 
and his father. For his case, nobody. But we question God for the bad things happening to us. We try to comprehend why things happen, but we are not trying to comprehend why these things happen to this person. And that's why I tell you, why does God allow suffering and pain? Because he loves you so much. Amen? Amen? God loves you so much. That's why he allows it. Okay? We are not remorseful of what had happened to Jesus Christ because it didn't happen to us. It didn't happen to our family. It didn't happen to our loved ones. I don't care. But if that happens to our loved ones, oh man, we will be extreme God. Okay. And probably we might be cursing God in the process. I don't know. You see, and another question why we are not angry it's because it is for our benefit, right? Who would be angry at someone giving you something for a benefit? Will you be mad? If I gave Brother Kennedy food because he is starving, will he be mad? Will you tell me, Brother, I'm so angry at you for giving me food. You're so rude. Then I gave him water. Oh, Brother Kennedy, I, I know that you're so thirsty. Here's some food. Oh, you're so rude. <laughs> will he be mad? No, of course. He will be more thankful to me. He probably will embrace me and he will give me a kiss. You owe me a kiss later, brother. <laughs> you see, nobody is angry at God when Jesus died because it's for our benefit. Because we will have heaven. And why would you angry at someone giving you something that would benefit you? See? Now, finally, oh, see, sorry. In Romans 5 8, see, God tells us that He demonstrates His own love. Love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See? And again, Christ died for us because we are so powerless. We are so helpless. We are so weak. So that's why God allowed suffering and pain. He allowed it to happen to his only son because we are helpless. We are hopeless by our own. God needed to put a remedy because of what had happened in the creation that sin entered the world and that remedy fall upon his only son, Jesus Christ. The third and last one is pain is good. I was asked, how come pain is good? It hurts, right? Your your back hurts when you're when you are older. Many many pains, joint pains, rheumatism, arthritis. We call it arthritis. I means ouch, arthritis or arthritis. See, how come pain is good, brother Mike? It's counterintuitive. <laughs> Come to think of it, but <clears throat> there he, there is a a um, certain Dr. Edward Paul in abcnews.com. You can go to this website and read his article. He said that pain is useful in a number of different ways. And why our bodies hurt and why pain is important are for a number of reasons. Pain alerts us to the fact something is not correct physiologically and that it may lead to a greater damage to us. So that's why pain is good. Right? So if your body is aching, don't complain. Tell yourself, mm, pain is good. <laughs> you know, and, and he even mentioned that uh, our goal is not, listen to this, our goal is not to make the pain go away. 
What's countering to with him again? You go to the doctor because you're, 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 you're feeling pain. And the doctor will tell you, you know, our purpose is not to take the pain away. You go home. <laughs> but really, according to medicine, that their goal is not to make the pain away. And we are trying to make the diagnosis. But rather, to perhaps observe the patient over the course of 12 to 24 hours to see if the pain gets worse or the pain completely goes away on its own. Because that will give us an indication as to what diagnosis is and then how to proceed. Well, of course, they were not talking about the chronic pain. So, that is pain. Pain is good. You see, pain is actually good. We have pain and suffering and only have two choices when you have pain and suffering. You can either run away from God or run towards God. That's only it. That's the only choices. And when you run away from God, here is a thought. If you run away from Him, the question is, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going to look for help if you will run away? God. You run away, you go to Satan. Again, I've never heard somebody in my life, personal experience, I never heard somebody pray Satan. I never heard somebody, uh, of course, when you watch YouTube, there are those Satan stories. They pray to Satan. But I never heard somebody you know, pray to Satan. And thank you, Satan, for all the blessings. When you are sick, even, here is the thing, even those who don't believe in God, when they are sick, when they hit rock bottom, they will call upon the name of the Lord. Because they know deep inside them there is God. They are just so stubborn to admit that there is God. But when they hit rock bottom, they will call and they will bow down to God. See? Now, pain is good because according to one survey, it is an opportunity for people to come up stronger. See? Now, it means that they are learning good lessons about life. With suffering, people become conscious about God. With suffering, people become conscious about their life, the brevity of life, how life is so short because of pain. You see, pain and suffering warns us of a greater danger that lies ahead, especially our final destination. When we are suffering, it tells us that there is somehow something good that can we learn from this. And many people, they shifted their minds. They have this consciousness that there is God that they have the consciousness they have to turn to God and look into God for answers. You see, that's why pain is actually good for all of us. And pain is good because God is warning us. God is telling us to turn away from our sins, be mindful of the way we live, and come to Him and turn to Him instead of running away from Him. He is not patient, or He is patient with you. Instead, he is patient with all of you, all of us, not wanting all of us to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And that's God, or what God wants us to learn when we are having this pain. It alerts us that there is something wrong somehow in our life that needs amending and that we need to turn to God. Every morning is a blessing. God is patient with all of us. See, he wants all of us to come into repentance because the Lord takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. You see, he is not happy if someone goes to hell. He is not, some, he is not happy when a wicked person suffer and die. The Lord will take pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn away from their ways and leave. Brethren and friends, in Romans chapter 5, 1 to 5, if you have your Bible, please open it. 
Let's read Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, listen, we have gained access by faith. Into where? Into the grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, see, but we also glory in our suffering. See, because our sufferings, we know it produces what? It produces perseverance. And perseverance, it produces a, a kind of character that God wants us to have. And that character gives us hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts. You see, our second reason why God allows pain and suffering is because God's love. And God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given us to us so that we could all have heaven. And finally, my dear brethren and friends, I will leave you with our scripture reading. We started off with a scripture reading of Psalm 34, 1 and 3, 1 to 3. I will leave you with Psalm 34, 1 to 3. I will praise the Lord no matter what happens. No matter what. God is good all the time and all the time God is good. I will constantly speak of his glories and grace. I will boast of all his kindness to me. Let all who are discouraged, if you are discouraged because you have pain, you have this suffering in life, the Lord said, take heart. Verse 3, take heart and do what? Let us praise the Lord together. If you are suffering, I am not. Let us praise the Lord together. I will cry with you. If you're happy, I will laugh with you. But at the end, let us praise the Lord together and exalt his name. Brethren and friends, the gospel is yours. If somebody here would like to accept the Lord, please come forward. We call upon you to accept the Lord. Enjoy his blessings. You are enjoying his blessings now, but we want you to enjoy the ultimate blessings, heaven. We want you to have heaven while you are here on earth. Accept the Lord, Acts 2.38 reminds us, repent and be baptized. For what? For the remission of your sins. The Lord is waiting for you, and God bless all of you. I hope I shed some light in the matter. Why does God allow suffering and pain? We all stand as we sing the song of temptation. God bless all of you.